Hello, I'm Stephanie Ruff. And I'm Aviva Nabeski. We're the hosts of the Dressage Today podcast, where you can find us talking about anything and everything dressage related. Our conversations span the world of dressage from leading riders to local level dressage heroes. We're talking training advice, showing tips, and sharing stories to inspire your own dressage journey. So tune in, then tack up. Hello and welcome to the Dressage Today podcast, sponsored by ADM. In today's episode, we will learn all about being a technical delegate from small RTD Michelle King. Full disclosure, Aviva and I both know Michelle, who goes by Shelly, from our respective times with Vada Nova, which is actually the Northern Virginia chapter of the Virginia Dressage Association. We are really happy she agreed to talk with us, and we think it'll be great to see a side of horse shows that you may not actually know much about. But before that, in case you haven't heard, just a few days after recording our last podcast, Aviva had quite a dramatic accident on her horse, Leo, that resulted in five broken ribs, a punctured lung, and a fractured radius and ulna that required surgery. So the important question is, Aviva, how are you feeling? Surprisingly, really, really good. Um, It was a true accident in every sense of the word. I was on the buckle. I'm not sure, but I think Leo was stung. In the six years that I've owned him, he's never bolted and he's never spooked like this. So I think something happened. And, you know, when you're on the buckle and you try to grab the reins, you're not always really effective and I didn't have very much time. And we, um, we went out the door to my indoor and in my attempt to redirect him back into the indoor, I threw him off balance. So instead I hit the door and I think I scared him worse than, than (laughs) I was scared. And as I was flying through the air, I actually said out loud, Oh, this is going to be bad. (laughs) Oh, But I had the I had the wonderful, you know, opportunity to ride in an ambulance and we had to meet up in the parking lot of the McDonald's with the medic unit because I started to crash and they needed to start an IV and give me oh, oxygen. No. And I got to go to the new hospital here in Prince George's County, the new um, University of Maryland shock trauma unit. So um it was exciting and lots of fun, and I was very, very fortunate that, honestly, most of my injuries were, were pretty minor, and the surgery went smoothly, and I'm recovering quickly, and hopefully we'll be riding again on July 29th. Um, didn't even need a chest tube. My lungs repaired themselves. The fractured ribs are repairing themselves, and I have figured out how to do absolutely everything around the farm quote, non-weight bearing, Mm. except for riding, leading horses and picking feet. Okay. Well, and, and you, (laughs) you broke your left arm, correct? Yes. And I'm right-handed. So I was lucky the last time I got hurt, I broke my right shoulder and that was bad. Right. Right. So at least, at least you still have your dominant, your dominant hand. I do. I do. And my, my helmet was on. Good. And um, I'm not sure if I had been wearing a vest, if I mm. might have been in better shape or worse shape. I have a feeling that the sound of the explosion when it, when it opened might have scared Leo even worse. When I managed to uh, do inventory and stand up, because, of course, you know, I was alone and not expecting anybody for hours. Uh, um, poor Leo was standing halfway down the, the driveway and I, I called him and the sweet thing was so scared. He came trotting up to me and I grabbed the rein with my right hand and got him into the barn and put him in his stall and went to take off his bridle. And I don't know if anybody has ever tried to take off a bridle one handed, but honestly, you can't undo those buckles. No, I guess you can't now that so, you, now that um, you mentioned that. I, uh, no, no, I bet you can undo that. Yeah. Oh. But you know what? My horse, for everything in the world, you know, I talk about how difficult he is and everything else, yeah. but when, when the, the things get tough, he really steps up. He stood there while I used my teeth oh. and just stood there like a statue and let me take the bridle off. What a good boy. <laughs> 
So, oh yeah. man. And, and as a true horse person, you know, you're suffering from major injuries, but you're taking care of your horse. Well, yeah, I couldn't leave him in the stall with his bridle on, could I? No, of course not. That's dangerous. Of course. No. I mean, that's what we horse people do. I I will admit. That's right. I will admit I did leave his his saddle on, but I called my husband and said he needed to come down. And he took the saddle off and um, then called 911. And then called 911. You've got your bridle. Great. Absolutely. And again, I was very, very fortunate in the general scheme of things. It, you know, I didn't lose consciousness. Right. My helmet protected my head. I didn't break my back. I mean, yeah. horrible, horrible things could have happened. If I'd had the door open just a little bit more instead of hitting the door, which had a little bit of give to it, I would have hit the four by four, mm. you know, post that yeah. pulled up my indoor that sunk into concrete and I don't think I would be recording right now if right. that had happened. Right. So yeah. yeah. You know, it's only, you know, I'm I'm gonna be incapacitated for about six weeks, which when you're sixty three years old, six weeks really isn't that much of a period of time in your life. Yeah. It goes it so, goes fast. It does. So let's move along from that because that's not interesting. Uh, <laughs> well <laughs> We are all very glad that you are okay. <laughs> I think I can Thank speak you. for and everyone. And I do want to let all of the listeners know, I do want to let all the listeners know that this was not Leo's fault and that I'm not holding a grudge and that, yes, I'm planning on getting back on him and I'm not even afraid because I know what an anomaly this is. Right. So good. I just good. put that out there. Right. Okay. Good to know. Very good to know. Yeah. But yes, we, I actually then, you know, I have nothing nearly as dramatic to talk about. Fortunately, I'm okay with that. Uh, yes. But, but circling back to our, la- our conversation in the last podcast that kind of was about saddle pads and then started to drift a little bit into sun shirts, um, I have a follow up story for that. And um, oh, cool. yeah, well, you know. It's, it's, it's not an addiction, but it, it is definitely a thing I had to go and do because I, I bought two new pairs of seats or full seat tights that were on clearance because I'm on a budget and they, they were on clearance because they were discontinued colors. And I'm not so sure that they were particularly popular, pop, popular colors to begin with. Um, oh my well, Tell I don't know. Pick. Either either that they're not colors I would have normally picked. One is kind of a plum and one is a pretty bright royal blue, which is a little brighter than I would like on the bottom half of my body, but you know, whatever. So, but I liked the price and I liked everything else about them. So I bought them. But because these are you. yes, you know. I really needed them. Anyway, um, but since these were colors that I had nothing like. Of course, I didn't have any <laughs> to go with them. And while I am not strictly a matchy matchy person, I don't want to be all clashy clashy. So I was like, oh, I've got to go find something I can wear with these breeches. So, you know, so, but of course, luckily here in Florida, we have, you know, like our entire wardrobes are quick dry clothing and sun shirts because of, you know, that's what it is here. <laughs> So, so I can just go to the local store and shop the fishing section and there are a gazillion different kinds of shirts. So I went to, oh, yeah. yeah. So I went to, you know, a, a store here, shopped their clearance racks and found some really great deals in colors that match my now plum and royal blue full seat tights. So oh, good for you. I, so I had and now you order. need to get now, Stephanie, you need to get back <laughs> Saddle pads and wraps. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll work. We'll no. Work on that. We'll work. I don't know. You should. I should send you what I can do. I can send you pictures of my tights, and you can see if you have saddle pads in your collection that are that color. <laughs> okay, that'll work. Well, you know, t- tied in with that, you know how we had the whole discussion about I bought the yellow saddle yes. pad. Yes. So after I got hurt, a group of, of women that I teach um, monthly in, in clinics in Virginia, they got together and they sent me a get well gift. And it's a sun shirt. 
in yellow with galloping horses on it. And it's a get well present and it matches my saddle pad. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. So now we have, we have new sun shirts to wear. We have new outfits yeah. that, and you'll have to, you'll have to, uh, when you get back on and start riding again, you'll have to get a picture of you Sweet. riding with your saddle pad and your matching sun shirt, but no galloping horses for a while. You have to, you know, no galloping horses. <laughs> well, I will also tell you back to the, to the whole addiction of saddle pads and all the rest of it. So when I was in shock trauma, I, you know, the broken ribs were really very painful. Of course. Um, and I was wearing one of my favorite sun shirts. Oh no. It's actually a golf shirt and a pair of really old, but very loved breeches. And I looked at them and they looked at me and I said, cut them off. Oh, <laughs> I could, I mean, that's how much pain I was in. Yeah. I said, cut them off. Oh. And I tried to replace the sun shirt and they don't make it anymore. So you oh. know what I did? I bought three other ones instead to make up for it. Well, there you go. <laughs> A little retail therapy to make you feel better. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so we are expanding our sun shirt collections. <laughs> and and now we're not, I'm no more, no more saddle pads and no more sun shirts. And if I do, I'm not telling. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, you know, you're, you're going to go back you're going to go back and, and, and hide from that and not let anybody know, huh? <laughs> no, no. And anybody who sees me with anything and says, Ooh, is that new? I'm going to say, no, I've had this for a while. <laughs> I just dug it out of the closet. It was in the bottom of the closet. <laughs> well, the the irony is that the day before I got hurt, I had a lesson and I decided to do my matchy thing. And I have a beautiful sage green. Um, I think it's, I think it's an equestrian Stockholm, but I can't really remember which one it is, but it's a beautiful saddle pad with matching um, boots for the horse. And I wore that for my lesson with a contrasting green pair of breeches and a black shirt. And my trainer, who is not particularly into bling or matchy matchy, <laughs> was so incredibly impressed with how gorgeous we were. Oh. So that was my that was my last lesson before I got hurt. Ah, oh, well, you know. We went out with a bang. Looks good. That's right. In this week's Ask the L question, I am mm -hmm. very excited to hear your answer to this one because this okay. is one area where I know everyone can improve upon. And okay. the question comes from Kate and it is, where do you see people throw away points the most? And then as a follow-up uh -huh. question, what should they do to try and prevent that unnecessary loss of points. Well, you know what? I, I have continued to judge even while I got hurt. And I keep saying this to my scribes. The thing that I see people throw points away the most is lack of accuracy. People who just don't know their tests and so they approximate or guess. So, if you are writing a training level test, like let's take training level test three and you canter um, and you make your 20 meter circle and then the transition back to the trot is at A. It's not at K. It's not 20 feet before A. It's not six feet after A. It's at A. And if you're late with that transition, then when you're supposed to make the transition to your um, medium walk between A and K, guess what? Your transition to the walk is going to be late. So I am consistently saying in my comments things like balance transition, but late, <laughs> or even, you know, you, I, I sometimes, you know, the thing that's so hard about riding in a show setting is that you have to not only ride your test, but you have to ride your horse. 
So you have to be able to multitask. You have to be able to ride your horse within the movement that you're, you, you are in, but you need to be thinking ahead and preparing for the next movement. So I see so many people who ride a movement and then suddenly go, oh, crap, I need to something. <laughs> uh-huh. um, and then they, they pull on the reins and they do this really abrupt, hollow, horrible downward transition. So the horse is completely out of balance. And then they struggle to get the horse back into balance. And then they don't have enough time to get the horse really back on the aids to do the next movement. Right. And so every single test movement, they're a little bit behind the eight ball. Mm-hmm. So writing an accurate test, being aware. So many people learn tests and they, and they learn, I'm going to go down center line and then I'm going to track right. And then I'm going to make a 20 meter circle at B. Um, and then I'm going to go around the short side and across the diagonal and canter, but they're not really learning the test. And what I recommend and that riders do, you know, are, and, and Jane Savoy used to talk about this a lot, our bodies don't know the difference between actually performing an activity and the imagery of performing an activity. So I tell my riders, before you go to bed at night, ride your test. Mm -hmm. Close your eyes, lie down, picture the arena that you're going to be competing in, or if you've never been to that venue, picture an arena and ride your test. And it's not, okay, I'm going down center line and I'm tracking right. It's yeah. I'm heading down center line. I feel my horse underneath me. My legs are evenly soft against his sides. My hands are reaching forward. I'm planning, I'm planning, I'm doing a little collection. I'm lifting up my rib cage, a little close of the hand, sink into the saddle. I'm halting. I'm putting both reins into my left hand. I'm dropping my right hand. I'm nodding at the judge. I'm watching to make sure that the judge acknowledges me as I'm picking up the rein. And then I slide my leg back just a little bit, push my hips forward and ask my horse to move off straight. So for me, imagining riding the test generally takes at least twice as long as the test actually takes. Yeah. Um, But by the end of that, I've ridden the test once. And if you do that every night, Mm -hmm. Three weeks before you go to a show, you've now ridden your test 21 times and you've hardwired in a lot of stuff for your body so that when your nerves kick in, your body still remembers things and you are a lot more prepared for things. Yeah. You know, especially at the lower levels, accuracy is the single biggest thing that I see people throw points away on. The second biggest thing that I see is a lack of forward energy. And, you know, we all joke about the little 12 hand pony that is, is riding intro a in the big arena. (laughs) And, you know, you can go out to the the drive through and get something to eat and come back. And the pony is still walking across the the full (laughs) diagonal on a free walk. And, you know, we laugh about it, but, you know, honestly, a lot of those ponies are moving forward a lot more than the adult amateurs are moving forward. Yeah. And I recognize that going forward is an intimidating feel um, and that we feel that if we hold our horses a little bit tighter, we have better control. But honestly, the more forward your horse goes, the less chance there is of your horse doing something naughty and the more concentrated on you the horse is and the more engaged the horse is. And again, talking about forward isn't talking about tempo or speed. It's talking about engagement of the hind legs. It's talking about power of pushing. And we want to see that at all the levels, even starting at intro. Horses need to, you know, the the first thing of of the training pyramid is rhythm and relaxation. And that's a horse that is moving freely forward through the back. So, Kate, in answer to your question, learn to ride an accurate test practice your test as much as you can. Um, Not only literally sitting on your horse and riding it, you know, we all say, oh, I don't want to do that because my horse is going to memorize the test. Mm -hmm. Most horses don't memorize the test. And sometimes the horses that memorize the test really bail you out because you're not (laughs) doing what you need to be doing. So be grateful. So, you know, ride the test in your head, ride the test on your horse and think about trusting your horse to go forward with the energy that you need so that every movement flows. Yeah. Yeah. Visualization is a powerful tool. I, um, I 
when I was shown a lot, I definitely did that. I did exactly what you said, you know, like how you put your aids on, what you do, where you're, you know, where are you looking, you know, what's your horse feeling like, oh, this is something my horse usually struggles with. So I have to do it. Yeah. And, and you're right. It takes a lot longer to ride it in your mind, <laughs> but yes. it does make yeah. such a difference. It really, really does. And then, you know, there's a lot of debate. Some people say, you know, practice riding perfectly because perfect practice makes perfect right. performance. Right. And other people say, if you if you are fearful about certain things, um, fix them. So, and, and I don't know that I recommend doing that when you're practicing test riding, but if there are things that you're fearful about with your horse, um, I know that when I when I used to ride my horse Freddie when he was first broke, he was a bucker, and um, I started riding as an adult. And so when he started bucking, I tried to sit back and wait for him to stop bucking. <laughs> and I was talking to a friend who was an event rider, and she said, "Well, you know, what do you do when he bucks?" And I said, "Well, I grab my bucking strap and I sit back and I wait for him to stop." And she looked at me and she said well, why don't you yank his head up and kick him and make him stop bucking? And I looked at her and in all honesty, I said, you can do that? <laughs> I started as an adult and it never occurred to me that I could have that much influence on my horse. Uh -huh. So I started practicing riding bucks before I went to bed at night because my instinct was to go basically into fetal position. Right. And I was starting to teach myself how to come out of fetal position and at least lean back. But I started imagining my horse bucking and leaning back and grabbing one rein or the other and kicking him. And I did that over and over and over and over again. And eventually it became a more natural reaction to me. Now, when I sit on a bucking horse, of course, my first instinct is always to go into fetal position, <laughs> but my second reaction is get out of that fetal position, sit back, yank the rein and kick your horse. <laughs> and it has really stood me in good stead. Yeah. So for those of you who start thinking about, oh, well, maybe I should practice riding through all the mistakes my horse makes. Don't do that when practicing your test. Do that separately. Yeah. Very good advice once again. So if you have a question about showing or judging, feel free to email me at sruff at equinenetwork.com or reach out to us on DT's social media. When we return, we'll have our conversation with Michelle King. Gastric support just got easy. Forge First GS by ADM helps provide gastric support for horses of all ages and performance levels. Performance horses today have high energy requirements and face many stressors, including exercise, hauling, and stall confinement. An estimated 90% of performance horses face stomach discomfort caused by gastric distress, which can negatively affect their performance, attitude, and overall health. The unique triple action blend of ingredients in ADM's Forge First GS supplement helps support a healthy gastric pH while protecting and strengthening the stomach lining, helping keep your horse happy and performing at its best. Forage First GS, gastric support for the one you love the most. Learn more and find your dealer at admequine.com. Michelle King, who received her Dressage R TD license in 2014, is an adult amateur rider who has competed through second level. She has been on Vada Nova's board of directors since 2004, including a three-year stint as president, is currently vice president of the Virginia Dressage Association, and serves on the USDF's TD committees, is vice chair of the USDF's Rules Advisory Working Group, and a member of the USEF Rules Advisory Working Group. She has been a USDF PM delegate on and off for a number of years. Michelle retired in 2010 after working for the federal government for over 30 years. For most of her career, she worked at a federal law enforcement agency, serving as an HR program manager and the associate chief counsel for administration. 
she finds her legal training and mediation experience most useful for her role as a TD. In that capacity, she has traveled from Massachusetts to Florida and loves the opportunity to meet and interact with fellow horse enthusiasts. So Michelle, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I can't wait to learn about all things TD oriented. Um, but before, you know, before we get into the nitty gritty of that, could you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in horses and then more specifically in dressage? Sure. I grew up as an animal loving and in particular horse loving kid in a family that did not like animals very very much and so like all horse crazy kids we do what we can to ride and when my parents thought going to summer camp would be a good thing I said only if there are horses and so after I think one year at summer camp I stopped doing everything but hanging around the horses and became a born brat. We rode Western and played cowboys and had a great time. Um, And I did that till I was uh, 15, old enough to have to get a paid summer job. Stopped riding, always loved horses. And when I was getting ready to go to college, I looked at the school's requirements and there was a PE requirement and I'm not the world's most physical person. And I studied further and I discovered horseback riding met that criteria. Wow! So I signed up with enthusiasm and I actually decided to take some lessons the summer before because I had never ridden English. Um, so I did it and I loved it. And I then stopped for the rest of my college years and went to law school and moved to D.C. and ran into friends who were trail riding in Rock Creek Park. So they invited me along and the owner said, well, you haven't been on a horse in a while. You better take lessons. So I did. And I did the hunter jumper stuff. And I evented a little. And then the fences got big and scary. And I said, (laughs) hmm, let's keep all the horse's legs on the ground. And so welcome to dressage. (laughs) That happens to a lot of us. Oh yeah. (laughs) Especially as we get older. Exactly. (laughs) So then can you tell us exactly what is a technical delegate and why is it an important part of a horse show? So a technical delegate is a USEF, U.S. Equestrian Federation licensed official. And I explain it to people by sort of saying we're the referee or the umpire. Um, Not quite right, but a general sense. But basically our job is to protect the welfare of the horse to ensure that there's a level playing field for all competitors and help show management and judges apply the rules fairly to all competitors. What made you decide to, to go into being a technical delegate? I know there's so many rules. What, that, it just feels overwhelming to me. Well, You know, I knew I was heading towards retirement. I had worked for the federal government ultimately for 32 years. I'm a lawyer by training and also did a lot of HR work. So I did mediation, which I really enjoyed. Um, And I knew I was showing, but not enough to ever think that being a judge was my future retirement career path. But mm-hmm. when I thought about my skill sets and my legal background, coupled with some of the mediation, other things I had done, I thought that might be a good fit. And so I just started pursuing the prerequisites and it seemed like it was a good fit. So what does a TD do before, during, and after a show? I mean, I know that there's more than just being on the show grounds. What else is involved? 
Well, we review prize lists ahead of time Mm -hmm. um, to help show manage. We're, We're a resource for show management, for judges, and for competitors. And actually, pretty less so with judges, but competitors and show management were there before the show as well as during the show. So, I mean, sometimes show management gets questions about equipment Mm -hmm. um, and they'll have the competitor contact the TD. We review the prize list to make sure that the schedule is within the rules and that there's the assigned judges or Um, at the level to judge the classes they've been assigned and, you know, all the way up to classes that are qualifiers for national championships and the festival. Do you have the right judges? Are they running the right tests? So all that's the pre-show work. A lot of calls from management on you know, can we do this? And what about that? At the show, we train the ring stewards and we're there as a resource to them when they do their equipment checks. We, if not measure the rings, we eyeball all the rings to make sure they're the size they need to be and not cattywampus. And sometimes the letters are lo and behold, <laughs> <reversed. You're wrong. laughs> Oops. Yeah. I, you know, happens a lot after a lunchtime drag break when you think everything is fine. And then it's like, Oh dear. <laughs> um, we walk the competition grounds as Eva knows we are um, a resource for judges. So if they have any questions about something they see in their ring, they call us. Show management uses us to problem solve. There's been a thunderstorm. The show has to get put on hold. We work with show management about that. And then how do we reschedule and what do we do Mm -hmm. if there's no lighting and it was a three-hour hold and now we're looking at dark no lights you know gee maybe we better run the 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 classes that are qualifiers first you know it's it's that kind of collaborative effort to make sure what we're doing within the rule is within the rules but best serves um the competitors the horses and show management and then after the show reports um, we're required to do a very comprehensive report on the competition. And that's actually available um, once it gets reviewed and it, it gets posted on the U.S. Equestrian Federation's website. And anybody can re- research a show by competition number and, and see how it did in terms of complying with all the rules. Oh, Wow. So So, what's the most common kind of question you get from a competitor? Tack. 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 And 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 dress. I was going to say in jacket colors nowadays, right? Oh, but that's (laughs) going to change. That's going to change. Yay. It is? Um, It is, yes. There's new dress rules coming out um, December 1st, I believe. Um, Britches can now be dark. As well really? as light, really. Oh my! Yeah, yeah. for those slobs like me, who do well <laughs> in white britches. Yeah, I'm thinking yes. with my yeah, light gray, medium gray. Um, so lots of changes, and that's the key: is keeping current in all the rules. There are certain yeah. things competitors remember that haven't been in effect forever. <laughs> bits of bits of mixed metals sticks in people's minds. And that has not been a rule since I've been a TD. Oh, so it's funny. pretty funny, the things yeah. you okay. still hear. I, I thought that was still a rule. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Nope. Well, now, now, even you've learned something, Aviva. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's what we're here for. That's right. Education. I think I view the job as one of education. And, you yeah. know, sometimes you've got to, el- well, I, the show has to eliminate a competitor. Um, sometimes you just can't avoid it. The rule is that clear. But wherever we can educate, 
that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Things like boots on. Right. Right. And blood. Oh. Blood. Yeah. And, too long and when you, ex- and, and you know, even there, there's an opportunity to, to educate because sometimes the blood is, you know, the horse kicked himself yeah. and just interfered. But when you explain to a competitor, the public perception, Right. And the fact that the horses can't speak for themselves. And where do you draw the line about, you know, some gushing wound versus something that. So there are certain things that have to be black and white. And if you can, I always find that if you can explain to people the why and the rationale and use it to educate, they're much more. They're not happy if they're eliminated but at least their understandings. They're much more accepting, yeah. Now, are, are, are you able to actually eliminate riders or do judges do it or do you both have your own different ways of elimination? So it's a great question. We, we TDs never get to eliminate. Oh, okay. um, We are advisors only. So inside the sandbox, it's the judge and only the judge. Okay. And outside the sandbox, it is competition management. So if a judge misses something during a test, but a ring steward during a normal equipment check sees blood, sees an upside down spur, a whip measures too long, then at that point, they need, they would call me over and I would call competition management. Okay. brief them on the rule and all I can do is advise if the rule is very clear that it should be an elimination and if competition management doesn't want to do the sometimes not so pleasant task <laughs> then my responsibility would be to note that in my report okay and so can you then Can you, as the TD, approach riders directly and can riders approach you directly or does it have to go through management or something? Um, So the easiest part, I I think the answer is yes on both ends. And certainly every TD I've worked with and it's my way of operating as well, we want competitors to approach us. And in fact, one of the things I'm on the U.S. DFTD committee. And one of the things that we came up with was a little sign that we post, a little flyer that we post at shows where the scoreboard and other signs are where we say, hi, the TD for the show is, you fill in your name and number, explain what we're there for, protect the welfare of the horse, advise competitors and show management, enforce rules, and encourage people to call us with any questions. Yeah. I, we routinely walk through the barns. You know, it's a good way to see what the equipment looks like, but it's also just to get a pulse of the show. Are the competitors happy? I'll say, how's your day going? Everything good? Any concerns? Um, so, yeah, I think being proactive and being out there and a friendly face that people know they can approach me. Yeah. And, yeah. I was going to say, I bet that that probably makes a big difference that you are a visible presence, just, you know, wandering around and yeah, like you said, taking that proactive stance and making yourself available um, that, that probably makes a big difference and is, makes it not quite so intimidating then, especially maybe to a new rider or someone new to showing at that level. Absolutely. I think we wrote a few years ago, the TD committee wrote an article for the USDF magazine on the job of a TD. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember if we ended up doing this, but there was a line that said, Oh no, watch out. Here comes the police. <laughs> right. You know? and right. Just, I, you don't want people to start like, uh oh, what did I do wrong? Right. Right. Exactly. Do yeah. Coming up to the ring. Yeah. So, you know, I think making yourself accessible and friendly and interested, um, hopefully, we take, take away some of that perception and, and put forward the view that we're there 
to help everybody. Yeah. Well, most of my experiences with TDs have been very pleasant. And, you know, the kind of thing is that you said, you know, wandering through the barn and saying good morning and how's your show going. And I've found most TDs to be very approachable with, with things like, I know that I know that coats were waved. Am I really allowed to wear a black shirt with my white britches? <laughs> an- another another old told over. Yes. yes, shirts can be any color. Yes, that's that's one of the other ones. Absolutely, you know, and, and the the whole thing with what you can have on a saddle pad and what you can have on your shirt in terms of advertising and who can advertise. You know, just getting that confirmation, the confirmation that my, my spur is, is an acceptable spur, not too long, not, you know, not in the wrong direction, not something that's not allowed. I think that finding somebody that just can confirm that just takes the pressure off a little bit. And, you know, it's, and, and for people like you who are just so friendly and open, it's just so easy to ask that question. So thank you. That's that's what we hope. But, you know, it brings up a good point when you ask about approaching competitors. I always have to think twice about, well, when. So logos are a really tricky matter. And I'm like, hmm, somebody's in the middle of warm up is now the time <laughs> to yeah. talk to them. Right. Yeah. But yeah. on the other hand, you could have a judge that might be concerned about a logo. So it's always assessing the situation and trying to make some judgment calls. Yeah. 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 What's the strangest or, or most unusual question you've ever been asked? Oh, I don't know about strange unusual. unusual. <laughs> I've had crazy situations. Okay. What, what kind of crazy situations have you have you had that you can share? <laughs> so I had an I had an owner that almost assaulted a judge who oh, rang God. the ho- who rang the horse out for being lame. Um and I she came up to me with her face her finger in my face saying, we have a problem and you have to fix it. Um, And after a while, she was, I'm a doctor. I know what lame is and I'm going to sue you all on and on and on at one point, because I followed the protocol and asked if she wanted to have a meeting with the judge and I would be there. And we walked through the rules and how it's the judge's final and ultimate and non-reviewable decision on soundness in the ring. She's on and on that stupid. And why isn't there a vet? And it on. And at some point she finally says, that horse isn't lame. He just was born with one leg shorter than the other. <laughs> and at that point we kind of went, hmm. <laughs> okay, that, that might be a problem. Yeah. Pursuing Hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um when we closed our mouths, we thought at that point we just needed to end the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> that that was one of my more interesting moments. I had a show manager who um became incredibly belligerent with me. One of the things we do is measure ponies we're certified to do that and we have to be to keep our license and she had a student's pony that had recently been imported and obviously was not inexpensive and the pony wasn't a pony Pony. and she was just belligerent that I ruined the value of that animal's price for the rest of its life and it got so intense that I wrote that up in detail and she got fined by wow. USCF yeah so I've had some it's you know but then I help someone um and problem solve and right. so you've got the the good and the bad of course like like everything <laughs> mm-hmm. And no two shows and no two days are alike. So it keeps it interesting. Oh, I'm sure. What's the process of of becoming a TD? How how difficult is it? How much education and training is required? 
it's pretty extensive. There's a long list of prerequisites um, that basically are in place to make sure people have a solid background in the sport. So you have to be, and they change. I think they just got revised recently. So I'm not going to give any exact requirements here, but I can refer you to where you would find the most current. But you've got to be involved in show management, either as a manager or a secretary or an assistant. You have to have been a ring steward, I think, a couple times and um, score and do numerous volunteer assignments. Mm -hmm. And that's the prerequisite to get accepted into the training programs. Once you're accepted in the training program, then it's primarily a matter of apprenticing. Okay. Um, and that's just on-site training. And once you complete that and assuming you do the right number of shows and the right level and some have to be out of your state and some have to be out of your region, Okay. Um, and then you get evaluated by everybody you apprenticed with and all the show managers of the shows. If all that is okay, you then get to take a exam, oh a written, extensive <laughs> written exam. Yeah. Wow. And then you pass that and then you get to be a TD. And is it doing education a, for you as well, things that you're required to do to keep the license? Yep. There's a, a clinic requirement every three years, as well as a recertification of your pony measurements. So, wow. and that's a hands on <laughs> practical exam where we go out and they line up a barn for us to go to. And the last time I did it, it was in the snowy, freezing temperatures of Salt Lake, outside Salt Lake City, where we couldn't, we oh, couldn't oh, find nice. any of the whorls, the markings on the ponies, because their coats were so thick. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, much hair. Massage <laughs> horses don't look like this. Um, <laughs> and then if you're crazy enough, you start out and you're a small R. TD, and then if you're crazy enough, like I'm in the middle of doing now, you decide, well, what the heck, might as well put in for promotion. (laughs) So you start the process all over again. Oh, my my goodness. So it's it's becoming a lawyer was probably easier, right? (laughs) Well, I don't know about the bar exams. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, okay, maybe not. (laughs) Although I was pretty panicked about taking my my test, I kept saying I haven't taken a test in thirty years or so. Yeah, it was right, right. No, I I hear you. Having terrified us all. Why would anybody want to be? (laughs) Who want to do this? That was yeah, my question. you know, <laughs> if you like being involved in horse shows, getting to meet people, um, travel, <laughs> I mean, we have to get hired by the shows. So you have to sort of get known. And as you get more known, the universe that you get to work expands. <laughs> um, one of my most exciting things was I think I was I was the teacher for what I think was the first dressage show that started up after the pandemic freeze. Um, There were other shows that weekend, but this one started on Friday. So we're pretty convinced we were the first show back. And that (laughs) was in Minnesota. That was in Minnesota. I think they couldn't find anybody else stupid (laughs) enough or (laughs) brave enough or willing enough to, to work. And I knew the show manager from... Um, working with her in Florida. So she called me up and I flew to Minnesota. And and so wow. I feel like that was a contribution oh, to the sport that was important mm-hmm. for me to make. And I think that's my ITD. You know, I love dressage. I love horses. I think what we do is important. And um, I think there need to be people who make sure we do it right. Well, and obviously you are one of those people. (laughs) I try. (laughs) And we're grateful to have you in our region up here. Thank you, (laughs) Shelly. Yeah, you're welcome. (laughs) 
but well, and this has been very educational for me. I've learned something. Aviva, I think you've learned something. Oh, a lot. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and hopefully um, our listeners have uh, learned something. And Shelly, if, if people do want to find out more or, you know, find out more about it or, you know, how to kind of get started and stuff, what websites, where's the, where should they go look? So right now, the function of licensing rests, always has and still does rest with USEF, the Equestrian mm-hmm. Federation. But the education piece is now in the hands of USDF. So there's actually okay. information on both websites. But to find the prerequisites, there's a document on the USEF site I believe if you click where the rule book is, there's a tile for it. But I know if you Google, it's called the Policies and Procedures Manual. And that contains the path of becoming a licensed official for every discipline from course designer to Western dressage judge to dressage judges, and technical delegates. And that lists the prerequisites and the requirements once you're in the training programs. So that's the best starting point. But there's a lot of great education on for technical delegate resources on the USDF website. The Policies and Procedures Manual would be on EF. <laughs> But DF has a lot of good education material on the role of a TD. Okay, great. Well, we certainly appreciate you coming on with us today and sharing sharing your wealth of knowledge. And um, we really appreciate you taking your time. It was great it to was talk fun. to you, Shelley. Yeah, I had a great, it was fun. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, have a great evening. Thanks again to Michelle King for talking with us today. And thanks also to ADM, our sponsor for this episode. Thanks for listening to the Dressage Today podcast. If you've missed any episodes or to subscribe, go to Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. While you're there, please rate and review the show. Learn more and read in-depth training articles at dressagetoday.com or you can visit our subscription video site on demand.dressagetoday.com. Be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. Happy riding, and we'll see you at X. The Dressage Today podcast is a production of the Equine Podcast Network, an entity of Equine Network, LLC.